How a vivisector, a mentee of the legendary Harry Harlow, decided to become a cruelty-free scientist. It's all about the ethics for John Gluck, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, how a mentee of one of the most despised animal experimenters came to terms with his past and discovered his ethical identity as a scientist. John Gluck experimented on upwards of 100 rhesus macaques during his career that began at the University of Wisconsin, studying under the notorious experimenter Harry Harlow. Gluck found his way when he began to see the monkeys as patients, not as test subjects. But the ethical foundation went back to how he treated animals with kindness as a kid. That helped him see that what he was doing to the animals in the name of science was just wrong. After some time at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown, Gluck became a bioethicist and found a new life as a professor of psychology and senior advisor to the president on animal research, ethics, and welfare at the University of New Mexico. In 2016, he wrote a book, Voracious Science and Vulnerable Animals, A Primate Scientist's Ethical Journey, which has become a guide for young scientists who refuse to do science without ethics. Here's my conversation with bioethicist John Gluck on the PETA podcast. After the book, and it's taken a while, it's taken some time. Do you regret not doing this sooner? I think the book followed uh, my sense of regret uh, that, uh, you know, once I think I, I kind of, in, you know, was able to fully encounter what I felt like. Uh, uh, I had missed or not understood or not paid you know proper you know uh, ethical attention to uh you know I, I was very regretful and um and I would say that uh, you know there were the main problem I had was I didn't know who to talk to about this and and when I, when I was uh, struggling with the questions about uh, you know how to how, how to continue my work or not um, there was very few people in my life, uh, that other than my family, uh, that I could talk to about this. I mean, professionally, uh, there, there wasn't much in the way of, uh, individuals. There was one particular individual, but, uh, th there were very few people I could go to like fellow, you know, colleagues and so on and say, I, you know, I'm having these questions and, and I'd like to talk to somebody about it. And uh, there was uh, not very many people who were interested in hearing it. That, that must have made you feel somewhat of an oddball. Did it? Did it encourage you to say to think I must have made the right decision, or did it make you say I better put the white coat back on? You know, I I, I think by the time I was uh, uh, you know looking for you know you know people to have a conversation with. I was pretty deep into the the uh, uh, perspective of I knew what I was doing, and I just wasn't sure exactly how I was going to accomplish it. Uh, you know, one thing I did do uh, was, uh, you know, I had a, a, a man in my life, uh, Brett Snyder, who was a, a, a research veterinarian at, at my institution, and he was the person I could talk to about it. And because, uh, you know, early on, he had questioned me about whether I knew as much about monkeys as I thought I did. And because uh, I would ask for his help about, uh, you know, uh, achieving, you know, some sort of outcome or another. And he was very, very nice, but uh, would say, well, you know, you, 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 <laughs> these questions and these suggestions you have uh, indicate to me you really don't know the animal very well. And of course, I wouldn't have at that time. I would have called myself a, an expert laboratory primatologist. So that, I mean, that's really what got me thinking about you know my own assumptions about myself. But when I started uh, uh, looking seriously to have have conversations and to learn more about uh, animal ethics in general and bioethics in general, 
uh, I was pretty sure I knew what I was doing. Well, when no one would talk to you, and when you were all there out by yourself in, in some ways, it must have uh-huh. made you feel like you're onto something, that other people, you know, hadn't evolved to this point, but you must have really felt, I mean, did you feel like I've discovered something? This must be real. Oh yeah. I, I, I was pretty sure about that. I mean, the fact that I couldn't stir up uh, too many uh, conversations didn't dissuade me. You know, I, I go to one page in your book where you say the crux of the story is that you slowly became conscious of the animal's point of view. Yeah, and, right. And you recognize that what you were doing as a scientist didn't square with your own moral standards. That, right. That, that's a real schism that I guess, do most scientists live with that schism or do they transform like you did? Uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think obviously science is a, uh, a, a powerful dynamic in our society and uh, in our lives in general. But I think that, you know, there are, you know, limitations. And one of those limitations, I think, is uh, the uh, the emphasis that's there to, to quite an extent of depending on traditional approaches to doing your work. Now, I, I was very interested in, in uh, neurodegenerative disorders and things of that sort. And, uh, and that was, you know, from primarily observing them in my own family, people suffering and not getting much in the way of relief. But uh, I think what happens, uh, at least I can say for sure, in the uh, animal research world, you know, doing animal research first, if you're trying to understand a particular kind of uh, issue or problem or uh, human disease is is so naturalized. I mean, it's been going on since the, you know, the 18th century, that that's how we think about, well, what do we do now? What's the first thing we do? Well, you start with, you know, dissecting an animal or you start, you know, you know, uh, exposing an animal to this experience or that experience and so on. And, you know, it's, it's what, uh, uh, you know, some people have called uh, a thought style that gets developed. There was uh, oh, a, a microbiologist back in the 1930s, ma- a man named uh, uh, Ludwig Fleck, who uh, wrote wrote about this, and and he talked about thought styles and the solidarity that gets created around members of a of a of a uh, collective. Hey, John, are you talking about science? Or are you talking about a cult? Well, I, I think what he what uh, what what Fleck was talking about was the uh, uh, what were the things that we had to be very much aware of uh, in, in order to have a solid and valid science. But he also recognized, and others, of course, have, have recognized it as well, that uh, you know, uh, doing science is also uh, a social activity. And uh, and some of the dynamics that control and influence social dynamics in non-scientific settings also uh, uh, find their way into understanding about how we're going to operate in a in a particular scientific lab. And uh, so uh, I, I I wouldn't use the word cult, but I would use the word collective. That there's a uh, you know that you you you, you develop a a, a a a sense of confidence in what you're being taught about how to proceed with your work. And so everyone should look at their org chart to see how this confidence collective thing comes up and how thought styles have a, a role here. And so, what was the scientific thought style that you were were you trapped in it? Is that how you view it now? Well, you know, I the, the thought style that that I found most um, uncomfortable was just what I was saying. You couldn't get people to talk about the ethics of the work, and uh, and uh, l- l- let me let me give you an example of that. I was uh, I was invited by a uh, um, a member of the uh, medical school faculty to debate him about 
whether nature or nurture uh, was most important in the development of intelligence. And uh, he called me up because I had been I had been doing work looking at uh, non-human primates who had been uh, raised with uh, limited social experience and comparing them to uh, animals raised in fairly normal situations. And I was comparing them on their basis, on the basis of how they could solve complex discrimination problems. So he, he saw me as a person who was an individual who was emphasizing that experience influenced intelligence. And he was taking the side that predominantly intelligence was a, you know, a purely genetic thing. Mm. So, so anyhow, we, we have this, uh, this, um, debate. No, it was a debate. It was, it wasn't, it was very, it was a very pleasant kind of setting in front of about 150 medical students. And, uh, and he was talking about the work, uh, you know, uh, that was uh, these twin studies that had been going on for, oh, I don't know, about 80 some odd years, you know, comparing the intelligence scores of twins raised together and raised apart and things of that sort. And of course, the, uh, the evidence there was that there was a very strong connection between uh, twins who, even though they didn't have the same environment, they tended to uh, demonstrate similar kind of intellectual uh, IQ performance. And, um, and I gave some study, uh, I talked about some of my own research where we were, we were feeling that we could manipulate uh, intelligence and, uh, in uh, non-human primates by uh, either lowering or increasing the complexity of the environments in which they live. And, um, but then, you know, uh, this, uh, it occurred to me that there had been a book written very recently uh, uh, before this particular debate. And it was written uh, by a, uh, a Princeton psychologist who had studied a lot of the, uh, the methodology and uh, papers of this psychologist, uh, Cyril Burt, who was like the, one of the first people to really do these twin studies. And and make the argument that uh, uh, environment has very little uh, very little to do with uh, development of intelligence. But anyhow, the importance of this particular book was this: this psychologist had determined uh, that the uh, Cyril Burt had made up his data, mm. or or had uh, to a, to a great extent had made it up, falsified. And, he falsified. It. He falsif- no, he falsified it, right? You know, and uh, and so I bring this up uh, in my 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 part of the debate, and I said, well, you know, there is this research that some of the fundamental studies uh, may have been uh, fraudulently produced. The, the the conversation stops, and you know, and students leave, and I go up to uh, uh, this fellow, and I said thank you for inviting me and so on. And he's looking at me like it was the most hostile look I'd seen on a person's face since being a teenager. Mm. And, and it was like, well, well, what's the problem? And I stuck my hand out to shake his hand. He says, well, and he wouldn't shake my hand. And he said, um, well, you know, the, the thing is I will never invite you again to have this discussion. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, you, you let the cat out of the bag. I said, well, what's that? What do you mean? That, no, he said, well, you, you, you confuse these students by bringing up the possibility of there being some uh, ethically significant fraudulent activity going on in that particular research laboratory. And I said, well, how is that a, isn't that something they should know? <laughs> and, uh, um, and, but he was like, you know, you confused the students. They needed to hear, you know, an absolutely uh, straight down the line. Uh, this is what what the truth is, and so on, and so forth. You you were the authoritarian in the white coat. Although on the other side of this doctor, you're the authoritarian in front of these medical students, 
And to the other doctor you were debating, you were the white coat brotherhood. You broke the white coat brotherhood principle, I guess, huh? Well, I, I guess so, but I didn't know I had such a thing. Yeah. I didn't know there was such a thing. I mean, I, I, I mean, I was aware that uh, there is an ethical uh, framework around science, uh, but what he was telling me was, look, look, we don't talk about those things. And uh, I mean, I was so shocked by that that uh, that it was like, well, I mean, it just seemed absolutely absurd to me. I mean, and it began, I began to reflect a little bit more seriously about how little I was thinking about ethics in the context of my work and in the context of my interactions with uh, uh, non-human animals. And, uh, uh, it, you know, it was like, you know, my, my idea for a study was uh, that was I just needed to have it. Yeah. And, and, if, I, and, and if I had a good idea, it, we, we just did it. And Compare yourself and your reaction with the other scientists. Were the other scientists that you knew, were they acting just like this other fellow? Like, we're just doing it and we're, we're part of this thought style. Is that is that sort of the way things, I mean, that was the status quo. That was the tradition, right? Well, I would, yeah, I think so. I mean, and I would say that, you know, it wasn't like, like, for example, you'd hear, you know, uh, evidence of somebody's lab perhaps mistreating animals or uh, doing, uh, you know, improper surgeries or things of that sort. But it wasn't something that was discussed openly. Was this the first time that it hit you? I mean, you said you were shocked, but was this the first opening that said, oh, this is an area of inquiry that most of my fellow scientists aren't going down. I got to go down in there and see. Well, I, yes, I think that's what, uh, that really, uh, you know, broke through the, the resistance of, uh, you know, just sticking with, uh, tradition and the ways I was taught to, to do research and how, to, how I was taught to come up with problems and develop methodology. Um, yeah, so I think that was a, that was an extremely important, uh, moment and it was, it was very, pretty early in my, uh, in my, uh, academic life. So, and, uh, but, but, but it wasn't enough to get you off track. Describe the moment, John, where it went from, here is a scientist who falsified the evidence for this twin study. When did it get to, here I am with a live monkey trying to get a study. I've got hundreds of thousands of dollars for me and the university. We've got to do it, but there's something wrong here. When did that moment happen? I mentioned earlier my interactions with the, uh, the uh, uh, animal, animal lab vet, Brett Snyder. Right. And I, I mean, and, and let, let me put it this way. This this particular veterinarian, and I worked with you know quite a few others over the over the years. I was in graduate school and so on. And most of the time, you know, the vets in the labs were expected to help you get the research done. If if an animal was losing too much weight, you know, you would go to the vet and say, "Well, you know, the animal's losing too much weight, and we need to get the weight up so we could continue this drug study or whatever it happened to be." And that's pretty much what most of the people I saw as researchers what they expected from veterinarians. Well, the difference with this particular uh, lab animal vet was he wanted me to encounter the animals as they were as they were patients not just subjects that they were patients you know dealing with the stresses and strains of what i was imposing on them and they weren't just experimental subjects so he was asking me uh or encouraging me to you know to try to close the distance between me and the animal so I would be able to pay more attention to what I was doing and how it was actually affecting them uh, with respect to pain and distress and things of that sort. So I think that th that his his encouragement to, in fact, just know more about the animal you're working with. You weren't looking at them as living beings before? 
Oh, well, of course you look at them as you, you, as living beings, but I think the emphasis is that you think of them, or I was thinking of them, as beings that fit a particular experimental design. And uh, what what was important was the outcome of uh, you know their response to the experimental uh, procedures, but not not necessarily encountering them uh, as individuals and getting to know them as individuals and getting to know more about how uh, you know animals express distress or uh, uh, or showed fear. You know, it's, it's, you have to be able to close the distance between you and the and the animal to be able to start uh, paying adequate attention to those kinds of dynamics when Brett Snyder called called your attention to this how did that change your world well it it took me back to you know what i what the way i thought about animals when i was growing up you know, in in my in my home, uh, you know, in my family, you know, animals certainly were family members, and and uh, they were they were uh, given high priority about what food they had, and and uh, uh, when they went to the vet, you know, there was a great deal of sensitivity to them. But I I found early on in my uh, academic life that having that kind of sensitivity. Uh, uh, didn't uh, didn't uh, participate well in some of the work that I was being asked to do uh, it, with animals, you know, like uh, uh, like raising them in particular uh, difficult situations or exposing them to uh, distressful situations or uh, you know uh, uh, keeping food from them so they would so they would perform more adequately in an experiment and so on. So it became a clash between, you know, what do I do here? You know, I want to be a scientist. I want to study these particular issues that I'm really fascinated by. I was going to have to put that kind of family uh, connectedness with the animals aside. Otherwise, I wasn't going to make any progress. You have these feelings as a kid. And now you're an adult and you're embarking on this career how do you rationalize this conflict that you're you're experiencing? I think, I think making the transition from uh, uh, you know being uh, have my primary relationship with animals being that of uh, you know you know domesticated members of the family to uh, sources of information uh, in a in an experimental context. Uh, I mean, it just uh, it, it caused me to ask or assume really. Uh, that the work we were doing justified the harms produced, and uh, and it seemed like most people agreed with that notion that uh, you know the benefits of the research process were uh, adequate to justify the uh, the difficulty difficult lives that many of the animals had to live. And so, once again, uh, the community, the collective, the thought style kept you going when when did it get to be too much was there a particular animal a particular experiment that made you say uh wait a minute here there's an ethical concern well i think you know i think uh, you know the experience of of being encouraged by uh the veterinarians to be to to close the distance uh, between me and the animals, so that uh, I was paying more and closer attention to them as beings that were capable of suffering. I think that made uh, an extra extraordinary difference, and I started, I think, doing that, closing the distance between myself and the animals. And uh, I, you know, I had uh, um, uh, it was it was not it wasn't like one incident that changed me. It was just a lot of uh, uh, discoveries over a fairly long period of time. Well, describe the key one that said, this is the, I mean, I would imagine that the distance was further than you thought, huh? Between when you were trying to close the gap. Yeah. Oh no, I think that's right. I think that, you know, there was, I know in, in, uh, in my book, I wrote about a, 
an interaction I had uh, with uh, a, a female rhesus monkey uh, numbered G49, and uh, I was uh, asked to uh, come up and look at a, a, a monkey that was limping while I was up in the uh, in the lab. I was watching this uh, this monkey G49 behaving in a way that I just couldn't quite understand what, what she was doing. So I spent a lot of time paying attention to her. And uh, she was living in an individual cage. And uh, I would see her sometimes. She would sit at the back of the cage, and then she would run up toward one of the uh, walls, which was a solid wall uh, made of stainless steel. And she would uh, press her face against it. And then she would sit back down and make all these facial expressions and things of that sort. And then she would go up on this wall again. And uh, and what I realized eventually what she was doing was there was a, a bolt missing in that solid wall. And what she was doing was using that bolt hole to see other monkeys in the room. And then going back and like she was trying to direct social signals through that little hole toward other monkeys. And then she would jump up there again to see if they'd reacted to it or if they should have been able to see it. And, and it was such a, you know, it was like just one of these moments. It was, uh, uh, you know, just how devastatingly uh, uh, extreme the limitations that this very complex, intelligent being was living in. And she was living in that situation because I put her there. And and when did it that limitation equate to cruelty and to something that was that crossed the ethical line? Well, I thought you know I you know I, I, I in that particular you know moment of experience with with G forty nine it was was what I was doing. Worse, the kind of unbelievably limiting constraints I had placed on her life. And um, instead of just automatically thinking, well, you know, this is research and we're going to find something important, or maybe we will, uh, I, I questioned it. I said I, I wasn't, I was, uh, became very uh, unsure that the uh, the benefits of my experimental work, at least in the area I was in, was making any sense given what I was demanding of the animals in terms of limiting their lives. And did you ever name G49? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was Moose. And, uh, and uh, yeah, she had a name, but uh, we tended to use the, uh, the numbers as, uh, you know, to, again, to keep that distance. And when you cut that distance, her name was, did you say Luce? Uh, moose. Moose. You okay. know, like a, like a moose. Yeah, <laughs> All right, yeah so, like a moose. So I, I thought you said Luce like Lucy, but she was Moose like Moosey. And yeah. so when you started seeing Moose as Moose and you cut the distance, how did that impact your scientific work and how did it impact, how did it cut the distance between you and science? Well, uh, I, it made it clearer and clearer to me that, uh, that this was a violation of my own, um, moral preferences and that, uh, I couldn't, if I was being honest, I couldn't be, uh, so confident that the, uh, the benefits coming from the work, uh, uh, were worth the uh, the limitations I was uh, uh, placing on these beings. If you weren't honest with yourself, could it bring into question the credibility of the honesty or the truth that you're trying to find through science? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say, you know, that, uh, you know, trying to understand, like I thought I was, uh, you know, primarily trying to do was the understanding how the environment influences brain development and, and, uh, supports activities like learning and so on. I think those were, I, I, those were good questions, but I, I became, you know, clear that it, uh, the way I was pursuing those questions, 
uh, was uh, ethically uh, um, improper and uh, that it called for other ways of doing this. So, not, not, not changing the questions necessarily, right. but uh, finding other ways to uh, uh, chase down this information in a, in a less damaging way. So you looked for alternatives, but, you know, given sets of scientists who'd say, oh, well, he's abandoning that. We'll just continue on the, the, the traditional way. We'll get to the answer quicker. Uh, was there that kind of competitiveness that you found amongst uh, uh, other scientists in the lab or competing labs? When I, when I was making this turn, you know, what, uh, how other people were, how other scientists and colleagues were conducting their professional activities became uh, uh, less of a competitive comparison. You know, it was, uh, I mean, I think the, uh, the question of how I could be a scientist with an ethical identity became the prominent and primary focus of what I was trying to accomplish. So, in other words, uh, it was still pretty much you and how you can deal with this clash. But as far as other scientists go, well, how did you, I mean, there's a gap there, too, between you and the other scientists. If you're going right. in these alternative right. directions, how did you deal with that gap with the, the people who would insist? Well, of course you could do that to Moose. Of course you could do that to yeah. G49. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, it had to eat at you because you had these values. How did you reconcile those things with amongst yeah. the other people in the collective? You know, when, when academia works well, um, changing positions or changing theories or changing uh, approaches to st your, the study uh, is usually accepted. And I think, you know, I was uh, a tenured professor at this particular time, so I had a, I had a job that I couldn't be fired from. And, um, and, of course, that was traditionally why, you know, uh, the tenure system developed, just so that people can change direction or go left instead of going right, as they had been in terms of their intellectual work. So I would say that, uh, you know, I think people were unhappy with me uh, when I decided that I needed to close the lab and I got more involved in bioethics uh, at a professional level. I think people were annoyed and uh, and I think they, uh, they I probably didn't get as good a raise as I might have uh, on some of those initial years. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't there was never a question that you you have to stop yeah. changing. But, it was the expectation you would. But, but John, what, what you're suggesting, though, is such a radical departure. I mean, you, you, you just mentioned how, how much you were, you know, in, in a way punished by not getting certain raises. But you had to see this as a real, as, as not just a, a turn, but a real 180 in a way as you search for alternatives and started to look at animals as, as real beings that, that felt pain and that the things that, that were uh -huh. happening in that lab were essentially cruel, cruel and horrific things that in, in some experiments, right? No doubt about it. From the, from the perspective of the animal, there's no question That's, that what you say is correct. I mean, you're describing some real not nice things that your colleagues are doing to you, like practically disowning yeah. you. And you were doing a total 180 from science. So that had to impact you somewhat or a lot more than you're letting on. No? Well, see, now I, I would put it a different way. What the, the path I was developing was not away from science but a way toward ethical science. And, uh, and, and, and uh, my, my plan was to begin uh, teaching more in the uh, ethics realm of research, uh, both human and animal. That was, my, uh, that was the decision I'd make. How, how could I con contribute? Uh, I could contribute as a teacher, as a professor teaching 
students who are you know taking on a scientific uh, profession uh, the importance of uh, ethical discovery. And uh, so that was how I saw myself. Uh, I didn't see I was leaving science, but I was I was developing uh, a proficiency in the uh, ethical frameworks that should embrace science. And, you know, you write in your book that a hey, this isn't a matter of being narcissistic or self-aggrandizing uh, or, a matter, uh, or a matter of presenting yourself as a model of virtue. But were there some people, some colleagues who did think that? That I was a model of virtue? When you were going um, this ethical route. Yeah. Oh, there's John trying to be ethical on us. John, put on the white coat and do the work. Come on. Come on. You're talking well, to your you know, buddies I, here. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying people didn't think that. Uh, but uh, I, I, the, uh, I, I didn't experience it directly. But I could tell you this, the way I did experience it directly. Um, I had a, uh, a sabbatical leave coming up, so which was a you know uh, a year off for to do other study. So I put in I I, I uh, looked around where I could go study uh, research ethics uh, during this sabbatical leave, and I discovered this uh, program at the uh, at Georgetown University at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. And I applied to the uh, Kennedy Institute of Ethics uh, to their visiting fellows program. And, uh, and they were precisely interested in people who were uh, interested in ethics and research, ethics and clinical care, things of that sort. So I applied. I got accepted. I submitted. Then I submitted my application for the, to take the sabbatical and go to Georgetown. And it was turned down. And uh, I went to the dean. I said, how is this possible? Here I am, uh, you know, applying to this perfectly credible uh, program to learn about research ethics. And he said, well, the committee doesn't think that's going to benefit your career. (laughs) And uh, I said, well, now there it is. That... uh, Developing an expertise in ethics of research is a waste of time. I mean, that came through loud and clear. And uh, uh, so I I said to the dean, I said, uh, uh, I I want you to talk the committee out of this because I know exactly what I'm doing. And if if they don't, uh, you and I will have to part ways. I'll have to go get a job somewhere else. And he uh, he bought it. He understood what I was saying, and uh, he made it possible for me to to go to Georgetown University and the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. Wow. Well, that was a, a a person who looked at the science or looked at it from the subjective point of view. But you can see where a lot of people would see that. Hey, you're showing us up, buddy. You're you're making sure. us you're yeah. making us look bad, but just like the other guy, you know, who debated you. You know, he said, yeah. uh, you know, you're breaking the brotherhood. Now, you know, that's – and coming from you, John, uh, if I can call you John, <laughs> Dr. Gluck, coming from you, you were a an acolyte of Harry Harlow, essentially, right? I mean, he was am, – am I am I placing you too high on the – on the uh, – on the uh, – the totem pole, or, I mean, you were really following in his footsteps. I, my graduate work uh, was done at the University of Wisconsin and uh, at the primate laboratory at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, Harry Harlow was the director. And uh, he was one of my active mentors uh, during graduate school. Uh, you know, I had I had three really solid uh, uh individuals who were involved in my education and Harry Harlow was uh, definitely one of them. I knew him very well. Did any of these ideas that you had come up when you were studying with Harlow and talking with him? Did you say, God, I, you know, I wouldn't do this to my cat at home. Why am I doing uh-huh. it to these monkeys? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, I, I think, uh, I think uh, th- this, this is a, it's an interesting problem. 
I mean, when I was at, at the University of Wisconsin uh, and and Harlow was uh, involved and deeply involved in my work, you know, he was already a world-famous scientist. The problem with being a world-famous scientist is, and I discovered this, that people don't challenge you. And I think he was in a, he was in a world uh, where he was well-known for his work on uh, neuroplasticity. He was well-known on his work on the intelligence and social capabilities of non-human primates. And then I think he started to get much more, he lost kind of contact with uh, what is a decent way to do science. And frankly, I don't think any of us, and I would say that about myself for sure, never challenged him about it. You know, it was like he was, uh, he was in charge. And if he modeled a way of doing research that was, seen as acceptable and then gained them all sorts of prizes and awards, uh, that was the model that we were going to follow. Some of those feelings of back home and how you dealt with animals had to have come up during that time, right? Sure, sure. And yeah, oh, oh, absolutely. You squelched them pretty much? Well, we, we, yeah, well, I would say yes, of course. That's exactly what happened. And now that you see Harry Harlow for what he is, I bet you challenge him now. I mean, he's he's gone, but you yeah, bet you challenge him now, right? Well, you know, I I, uh, I think a lot about Harry Barlow, and I mean, I'm, and not just the uh, you know some of the very painful studies that he did, uh, but you know, he was a very supportive mentor, and I think I didn't take advantage of him. When I didn't challenge him, even when I was saying, "Well, gee, you know, I think." This is going too far uh, in terms of an experimental setup. And uh, my the question you might ask is, how, he, how would he have experienced uh, those challenges? My sense is he would have listened because he, you know, he was uh, he was always he was ahead of the pack when it came to understanding the intelligence of non-human primates and. Uh, the uh, social dynamics of their development and so on. He was way ahead, but he didn't see the ethical implications of those findings. And uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, I think we, or some of his colleagues, failed him too. You say he would have listened, but how about this question? Were there ethical alternatives back then? that he could have embraced and should have embraced? Um, I think the, uh, the, 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 the alternative, of course, was doing what you could with humans. And, uh, and uh, the idea of, like, say, studying um, um, uh, orphans or individuals who have been raised in... Uh, in homes where they suffered abuse and things of that sort. I mean, that was a direction that could have been taken that would have been more direct uh, in trying to understand, you know, how development can go wrong uh, during, during the uh, socialization process. And, um, but it was like, you know, he, he was a primatologist and you know and that's another one of those limitations that we were talk we've been talking about is you ha- you you start thinking of yourself as a particular kind of person and this is the kind of work that you do not this work not the alternative work not the uh, other way of thinking about it so i mean i think he was uh, he was stuck there too um uh, but i should also say he got a great deal of support that uh, felt that he was doing what needed to be done uh, in experimental ways, uh, even if it was being done uh, with uh, painful outcomes and with non-human primates. John, you broke up a little bit. He got support from the university. What what were you saying? He got great support from? Uh, He brought in uh, millions of dollars worth of uh, money to the the, uh, university. 
was a, a highly sought after lecturer, and uh, you know when they're, they're and when people invite you to give a lecture, they usually want you to give it on what's made you famous. Yeah. And, you, know, and, uh, you know, John, uh, you write in your in your book. You say that to avoid ethical reflection requires an extraordinary level of self-deception, rationalization, and selective blindness. Uh, have you thought about that? I guess it's kind of like a cloud that hovers over you. Yeah. Have, yeah. Where, where are you now in terms of all of that? Have you now see clearly or what, what, what how how would you yeah. how would you put yeah. yourself now where would i put myself now i i i can understand what i was involved in and what some of my colleagues were involved in but i can't justify it um and i think uh, that quote you you uh, just read i think is it, i i believe that to be precisely true that uh, uh, it, it takes a, a good deal of not paying attention to reality uh, to carry on uh, some of that work. And uh, no, there's no doubt about that. There was an I idea in the book. You called yourself a monkey life thief. Explain right. that. Well, I mean, that's how I began to see what I'd done was... Uh, uh, it's just another way of saying that I was uh, what I was doing was not ethically justified. That I was uh, uh, apprehending lives and uh, uh, getting them to dance to my tune, and I didn't think the tune was worth humming after a while. And is there any sense of like how many monkeys you? you were, you know, that you dealt with? Did you ever quantify it and, and think about that? Oh, sure. I mean, after a while, the uh, the Animal Welfare Act required you to to submit uh, uh, records on, on how many animals that you were using, how many, uh, what species, uh, were they were they animals that uh, were being used in experiments that were painful or not? So I mean uh, that that process uh, required by the Animal uh, Welfare Act, I think, was uh, was part of it. You start to see the numbers of what uh, what what this work is requiring, and uh, uh, you know what. What would I say? I think I interacted with probably personally responsible for uh, certainly over a hundred uh, non-human primates. And, and do you think about the things that you made them do, or that you put them through? Besides, uh, like moose, G ninety five. Do you, is there one thing that you that comes to mind that you you know when you're more reflective and thinking about those days when you were in the labs that uh, it just reminds you that you're doing the right thing now. That was why I wrote the book because, because my sense was it wasn't enough to regret just in private. It was more important for me to regret and explain that regret uh, more openly in a public forum and hopefully uh, influencing some of my colleagues, uh, and so that they would understand what uh, what uh, motivated my changes and uh, why I thought it was important to have that discussion and to, you know, um, uh, extend the extent of the ethics education in science. That was uh, that was why I wrote that book. You know, and, you know, you anybody who's run, written a book knows, you know, it takes a lot of your life to do it. Yeah. And I was happy to provide it. The book, Voracious Science and Vulnerable Animals, a Primate Scientist's Ethical Journey. It's uh, by University of Chicago Press, and it's been out a few years. But it's kind of a building block, in a way, in terms yeah. of, 
you know, changing the direction of where science is going. Tell me how your book, your your exploration in in making science more ethical, how how can that change the future of young scientists? How can it change the direction so that we go away from vivisection? There's that term. How do we go away from that? Yeah. yeah. The, the kind of thought process that has to be involved here is is to uh, work at not limiting the emotional expression that you experience as a scientist. You know, there's a lot of lot of work and a lot of encouragement to narrow the emotional realm that emerges during search. Make it more narrow. Don't pay attention to. Uh, uh, you know, even maybe even to some of your questions, you know, carry on, uh, you know, continue, finish, finish the experiments, analyze those experiments and, uh, you know, think in terms of those kinds of things as opposed to what am I doing? How How is this work actually affecting my life? Um, you know, I, I've met, you know, many scientists over the years who have talked to me about how uh, their work uh, changed their lives and how they felt like they had to make up for it. So by, by trying to encourage that these kinds of topics become not hidden things that are whispered, uh, you know, uh, at, uh, at, at, uh, at times when you're just having some, maybe some uh, social event, that you're actually in taking on those kinds of questions in the in the flow of the science you're doing, and I think what 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 we're seeing now, of course, and I would say now meaning at least the last ten years, is that the validity of a lot of the uh, animal models that we used is being questioned, uh, and the question being, do they in fact provide uh, adequate insight into the human condition. And I think the findings have been uh, 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 pretty disappointing, I think, to uh, a lot of people in that that continue to do that research. So, but, you know, would you, would you, does it make sense to not pay attention to that literature? No. <laughs> what it requires you is to know it very well. And uh, from the perspective of recognizing that your work also uh, insults and hurts lots of other human beings, doesn't that, shouldn't that encourage us to seek alternatives in and of, the, in and of itself? Um, so I think uh, as scientists, we have to be connected to the world we live in. So and, uh, it's really a matter of asking more questions. Don't narrow, include more questions. You might find the better answer, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I, I again, I, uh, I, rem- I, it was an incident that occurred in graduate school that uh, has stayed in my mind uh, for all this 50 some odd years. And it was, we were, I was at a, uh, a meeting and we were all discussing the uh, research that had demonstrated that the chimpanzee Washoe had learned American Sign Language. And, uh, and we were having this discussion and it was all a very heady discussion about, you know, is American Sign Language a language and, you know, all these various types of linguistic analysis of the, uh, of the, of the data. And one fellow, uh, who was in this group, uh, raises his hand and says, I have a question. Well, what would you do or what would you have to do if this chimpanzee Washoe using American sign language signals out, let me out of here. Uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, what would your question be? What what would, you, what would your responsibility be? And I mean, he was raising an ethical question, and frankly, we didn't recognize it as such. But it was the great question. It was a great question, and um, those are the kinds of questions we have to be asking ourselves as scientists. 
And uh, well, you know, you know, John. One of the other questions is the question of relevance, and you know whether or not any of these studies are applicable or relevant to really a direct, you know, making a direct hit on the human experience or the, you know, uh, to answer yeah, yeah. the human uh, issues that, that are out there that you're trying to find answers to. And generally speaking, it's, it's not relevant, these animal studies, right? Well, I think, uh, I think what's becoming clear that, that uh, depending on the, on the animal models to give us direct answers to how to, how to intervene in human disease is becoming uh, more and more clear. It's becoming more and more clear that uh, they're not as effective at doing that as we once hoped they would be. So, and it's just it's the crying out for alternatives. So what do you tell the young scientists? And I know that one of the things that PETA uh, has done in the last uh, 10, 15 years is it's grown its number of of ethical scientists who are looking for alternatives and looking for ways to end vivisection. What do you tell the younger ones who are stuck in that, that, you know, we're not challenging Harry Harlow enough. We're not, we're not going to dare challenge our, our, uh, our, our community of scientists. How do you tell them to, or what do you say to them that would get them to, to to break to make a breakthrough for themselves. Well, I you know I I think the one of the major problems that students face in the animal research world is that when you get first get started in a laboratory that uses animals for biomedical or behavioral research, you you have to recognize you know enough to be overly trustworthy about what your mentors are telling you to do. I mean, you know, when you're, when you first get into the laboratory situation or you start taking laboratory courses and so on, you know, you're in a position to, you're being told how to do certain kinds of research, how to think about it and where the animal fits into all of this and so on and so forth. But you have to recognize you don't know enough yet to be critical of those suggestions you're getting or directions you're getting from your mentors. So it, it's like you don't turn your life over to your mentor. Like, uh, you know, she's got the, she's got the whole thing all settled and what she's telling me to do or what he's telling me to do makes total sense. That's just not the way we operate as, uh, thoughtful, ethical and creative scientists. I mean, that's the kind of thing I try to tell people. Um, uh, open your mouth. Be critical. Uh, ask naive questions. Um, they have a place. Don't be quiet and uh, uh, be civil, of course. But uh, you've got to be you've got to be verbal and allow your curiosity and your questions and your uh, even very difficult questions about ethical relevance to be expressed. And really, that's pretty good advice, not just for scientists, but for journalists and activists and citizens yeah. and people who right. are in public life or people who are dealing with public issues or just regular right. people, period. Right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, uh, I, I try to tell students, uh, students in science, especially in the psychology and neuroscience areas, you know, your job is to get smart and to know a lot about the brain and, and so on and so forth. But your job is also to develop an ethical identity. And uh, you can't leave that behind. And... Uh... You got to get rid of that self deception, I guess that you mentioned. Just oh yeah! Oh, exactly, uh, exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, that's one of the the main problems of uh, of uh, living life in general is trying to trying to not deceive yourself. So it is an evolution. The being a scientist, it is an evolution. Uh, this ethical journey, and. 
how how happy are you now? How comfortable are you now with yourself af- after having written the book and and after not af- after stopping doing what you you did to those animals? Well, I very uh, um, pleased about having made the change from being a uh, an animal scientist to a bio- bioethicist that is concerned with the ethical justification of animal and human research. I mean, I think this is where I've wanted to be for maybe for much longer uh, than I uh, I recognized. And um, I mean, I, you know, I came from a family that were, I mean, they were an overly religious people, but they were very ethical people. They thought a lot about what was the right move and what was the wrong move? That was a topic of conversation that was pretty common. And um, uh, not, not, we didn't discuss Plato, but we discussed, you know, li- living with, uh, with integrity. And uh, um, so I, in that, in that domain, I feel, you know, I were that I'm proud of. In, in general, I mean, I don't think I, I ever escaped uh, the faces um, of, of and frankly, I guess I'm glad I don't. I, I haven't forgotten them. Uh, I want to be reminded about how um, inconsiderate I could become as a human being, and so devoted to my own uh, success and uh, losing touch with the uh, the rest of the world around me, the animals. You know, John, you broke up a little bit when I was talk- asking you, when you mentioned faces, you said, in general, you, you don't ever escape the faces. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I think uh, uh, I, I, very few days go by where uh, either in... Um, Reflection, you know, have reading about somebody else's work, or just uh, you know being in you know in that reverie of, of being calm. When I begin to see the the cages and the, and the animals and the, and their predicament, and uh, seeing their faces as uh, individuals, uh, you know, seeking for justice and decent care, and that I. I missed a lot of those opportunities. So those faces you don't forget. Exactly. You don't forget. Well, John, uh, I, the, the good part of me should says we should end it there, but the bad part of me says, I must ask you a question about where we are in science right now, because Mm -hmm. we're in a kind of a funny place because of the coronavirus and public belief, yeah. public trust in science, uh, yeah. the way our leadership, um, I mean, it's somewhat of a different, and, uh, you know, question, but it's, it's related because it's all related to how the public perceives science right. and how we perceive the guys in the white coats and, we should challenge him, but but tell me what is what are some of your thoughts, given the specific time that we find ourselves in now, in our relationship with science. Well, you know, I think the uh, the uh, pandemic that we're experiencing uh, around the world, and certainly in the United States, I mean, what it illustrates, I think, is how complex learning is in the scientific world. You know, it's not like you conduct uh, one or two comparisons and you've got the picture of what one needs to do. Uh, I mean, it's you know, uh, like I was talking to a person the other day and they were saying, well, why don't we just protect the vulnerable people, people who are vulnerable to uh, COVID-19 and let the rest of us go back to work. And I said, well, do you know who all the uh, vulnerable people are? Uh, I said, I, I know. It, it, it'll take 
enormous number of amount, amount of research to discover all the vulnerabilities. It's not an answer that comes quickly. And the importance of communication and the, the importance of the public understanding how science actually operates uh, is, uh, I think it, it, we get to see that that understanding is not very good when you, uh, when you hear people just getting tired of uh, uh, being exposed with, to the, the, the important recommendations about public health measures. And the other thing that, that, that the pandemic tells us about is just that, public health. I mean, public health is, is an undervalued uh, dimension of our medical and scientific world. You know, it's more like, you know, you get, you get famous in science when you cure a disease. You know, if I, you know the person who finds the key to uh, the cure for lung cancer will be a very famous person with many trophies on their wall. But a person who is working to, to uh, modify the way we live in this world to benefit our health and how we can change our, uh, change our environments and our, and our, uh, uh, our diets and things of that sort, uh, uh, we have to spend much more time in public health and not just... Uh, finding the answers and cures to specific diseases. Well, John, John Gluck, I really appreciate your time. I I've enjoyed uh, our conversation and, and I've en- I, and I'm glad the dog barked there in approval. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I've, I've enjoyed it too, Emil. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And, and even though you called me Emil, I I say Emil, but you're the first. Oh, one. Emil, okay. I, I'm going to let you say Emil because that's good. I because you know, it it's an it's a it's an authentic Emil coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so but I I hope that we can talk again because this is an ongoing thing. Um, message, uh, mess, you know, your message to young science scientists, your message to people who are you know, who have to deal with science, uh, your message to the, the elders in science, you know, that's, yeah. it's important that they, that they all consider, uh, the ethical questions. So John, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Emil. <laughs> so- <laughs> and don't lose my phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I would, hey, no, uh, you know, thank you, John, and thank you for your, your patience on all the, this damn technology. You know, well, we got through it. We got through it. Bioethicist John Gluck, professor emeritus in psychology and senior advisor to the president on animal research, ethics, and welfare at the University of New Mexico. Find out more about how PETA is making science more ethical as it works in cruel and hideous vivisection practices. For more, go to PETA.org. And that's our show for this time out. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K or on AMOK.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA.
Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.